my lives. Uh, welcome back again. Uh, this is my life. I missed yesterday. Sorry, I was traveling. But today I really wanted to speak to why we should be aware of high blood sugars, even if you're not a diabetic. And the reason I say this is that I'm running some, <clears throat> some special groups called Glucose Mastermind because I really want individuals who are either diabetic, pre-diabetic, or non-diabetic to understand what their body is doing. And we've done some really fun experiments with our first meeting and we're going into our next meeting tomorrow with my beta group and I am opening up additional groups next month. However, um, really wanted to share with you why this is important. And many times we'll check your blood sugars like a fasting blood sugar or we'll see an A1C on your annual exam. And that's just a glimpse in time, but it doesn't really tell you the full story of what your body's doing with blood sugar. For example, you may have elevated blood sugars um, after eating on a regular basis, but then it drops back down. So it really depends on a few factors, your activity level, your BMI, or your body composition. You know, genetics plays a predisposition, of course, puts you at higher risk for diabetes further down the road, the types of food that you're consuming on a regular basis. And so I just wanted to kind of go over some things of why it's important to keep in mind while we're eating, potentially what our blood sugar is doing, especially that, those first two hours after eating food. So the first thing I really like to speak to is oxidative stress. And many of us under have heard this term like um, oxidized LDL, which is the bad cholesterol, which is oxidized, which makes it very serious and um, damages your heart arteries, increases risk for author atherosclerosis. So basically high levels of blood sugars can lead to increased production of like free radicals and the oxidative stress, which so this damages cells, it damages your proteins, it damages your DNA. And then there can be a lot of complications, especially with the diabetic with these high blood sugars. Um, elevated blood sugar also increases inflammation. So maybe you have this chronic inflammation you can't quite figure out. Maybe it's an elevated blood sugar, especially after eating. That's where a, a continuous glucose monitor is very, very helpful because you can see 24 seven what your body is doing with the blood sugar. Even if you're eating a, a plant-based diet, it's really interesting to see certain foods with certain individuals can trigger quite a response. And sometimes you think, oh, it won't be that bad. But I was surprised, honestly, I was pushing the limits a little bit on maybe not whole food plant based, but definitely tried some things in the vegan realm and was quite surprised by the amount of food eating, how the food was ordered. Of course, I certainly know that um, helped patients it helps patients to keep blood sugars lower if we first, let's say, start with a salad and then follow with more of the higher glycemic foods. But there's some really interesting things that we're learning and discussing with each other in our group, but I really wanted to just share that with you, is that just being paying attention to eating as many of the um, non-starchy vegetables as possible, right? Those greens that Dr. Esselstyn always talks about are really, really important. Um, <clears throat> so there's one thing... Uh, that also could be of interest is maybe the HSCRP, which is your CRP that's elevated with your heart arteries that you may have had some testing done. If that seems to be chronically elevated and you can't quite get it under the optimal, that might be something to consider is what is your blood sugars doing? So again, um, it can be triggered and be higher if you have whole body inflammation, if you've been recently ill or something else. Um, the other thing that um, high blood sugars do is it impairs your endothelium, which is the uh, inner lining of your blood vessels. And that can lead to atherosclerosis, hardening or nearing the arteries. It increases risk of things like heart attack and stroke. Um, of course, we all know that elevated uh, blood sugars leads to chronic insulin resistance. Um, and it can progress the pro worsen the progression towards type 2 diabetes. Um, chronically elevated, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, blood sugars also really damages the pancreas. The beta cells that actually produce insulin um, can lead to loss of the beta cell function. So um, I think it's really fascinating to see just how high these blood sugars can go. And when you look at the studies, it's really fascinating. There tends to be some uh, variability. There was one study that was really interesting. I was reading last night that they had classified people according to their blood sugars um, over the course of 24 hours. They did it for 10 days, blinded. People didn't know what they're doing. They were healthy, non quote unquote diabetic prior to the study. There were a variety of age ranges, um, all over the age of 18, upwards past 60. And what you saw were the majority of people, 
96 or so percent of the time, were in the range between 70 and 140 on their blood sugars, even after eating. Um, after eating, you'd have a little bit more, as you get older, go above that 140 after eating and upwards uh, towards the 180. So when you look at the parameters on a CGM, they usually typically will set them between 70 and 180. But I am almost thinking that for a non-diabetic, we really should be looking towards trying to keep this uh, 140. Because what we saw um, on the lower end, many people will, maybe 14% or so will be lower uh, than 70, especially overnight. I typically will run under 70 overnight. Um, but below then, below 54 is very unusual, and that's usually a concern. So I would say anywhere between that range of 60 to 140 is probably where we want to be hanging out if we're a non-diabetic and um, really thinking about the foods and what they're doing. Because, <clears throat> um, again, we don't want to see the progression of some of these other things like inflammation and, um, of course, oxidation and such. Um High blood sugars also cause glycation of proteins, right? So basically you can get the formation of advanced glycation in products or the AGEs, which you've probably heard about, um, especially when you're putting foods that have high protein and high fat under high heat. Um, so people will be concerned about, for example, roasting nuts. So um, those can be also lead towards a variety of things, so, but lots of inflammation, um, can lead to complications with your eyes, your kidneys, neuropathy, especially if you're diabetic. It can affect your mental health, right? So if you have fluctuations of blood sugars going up and down, it can certainly make someone not feel well. You'll see that with kiddos, like for someone gives them candy and then they go high and they come low and they get really um, anxious and upset and very easily will throw tantrums and such. So anyway, Humans, big humans can also throw tantrums. They call it hangry now. They just give it a different label. But if your blood sugars are rapidly falling and rising, you're just not going to feel well. And um, you're not going to function optimally regardless of whatever you're doing, either it be in a mental task or a physical task. And so just really quickly, um, let me go over my list here. Oxidative stress, inflammation, endothelial dysfunction, insulin resistance, beta cell dysfunction, Glycation of proteins and effect on your mental health. So again, this of course makes sense if you have type two diabetes or you're um, are dealing with prediabetes. It means that you're not quite in, on diagnosis or given the diagnosis of diabetes quite yet. Um, but what it does tell me is that the train has left the station, meaning that you're well on your way to having type two diabetes and you can still suffer the complications of a type two diabetic, maybe not as rapidly, but you're certainly um, at risk. But then we have these quote unquote phenotypes. We have those who, and especially as we get older, we're at higher risk of this, but we'll see what we call high variability after eating. So you'll see this really high fluctuation that go up and down. And so that's another thing that you can pay attention to in the CGM, <clears throat> which I'm going to be paying attention to as well to some other folks. I didn't really think about it too much um, until I was reading more about these, this research paper on the variability of non-diabetics. And you can see variability um, of a, a great concern, especially when you have someone who's on insulin, right? Because you don't want someone going really high, taking a lot of insulin, getting too low, then they take some food and get the blood sugar back up. So that variability is a concern. And so I'm thinking definitely the parameters may be tighter, 60 to 140-ish, somewhere in there, uh, for the non-diabetics and really making some food choices to see, one, how your body feels. Also, maybe it'll have an effect on your cholesterol levels. It may have an effect on your overall fasting blood sugar. Maybe it'll have an effect on your sleep, maybe weight loss, um, a variety of things that might be improved there, maybe your blood pressure. So um, again, these are some interesting experiments to to trial with, but you really got to have the data. And in order to have the data, you need to have a CGM. So maybe your doctor can prescribe it or feel free to join uh, the new glucose mastermind as I get these new groups started and uh, definitely be learning together and sharing all of our information. I'll be putting on a new CGM later this evening. And, uh, you know, I did some really crazy fun experiments, but now I'm going to hone in and see if I can tighten up my variability as well. And so um, I think there's lots to learn here. And uh, especially in this world of 
fast food and processed foods, and especially if the the quote unquote plant based options that are more processed that people are they're like, well, I want to help the animals and the and the climate, but they maybe make less than optimal choices for themselves. And so I think there's some interesting lessons to be learned there. So I hope that was helpful. Um, feel free to let me see if I had any questions here. I'm going to jump over here. Great. Okay. So yeah, I hope that was helpful, but I would love to see if you guys have uh, any other thoughts or questions about that. And um, again, would love to um, have you uh, consider joining the Glucose Mastermind or the Healing Kitchen. If you go to drmarbus.com and you'll see a Healing Kitchen or Glucose Mastermind waiting list. If you'd like to join, please consider doing so. And like I said, I'm licensed in all 50 states and including DC and happy to see you as a patient or um, see you in the Healing Kitchen with myself and uh, Brittany Giruti or the Glucose Mastermind. So yeah, so that's it. And uh, more lessons to be learned. And I'm excited to share more with you guys next time. Have a great rest of your week and we'll see you tomorrow.